you know, in spite of what Mike just read from uh, Acts chapter 2, knowing and accepting the truth of God, knowing and accepting that God loves us all and that we are called by God to share that in who we are living together, it's not always quite as easy as that Acts passage makes it sound. Sometimes there is some rough and tumble and hard-edged kind of experiences that are involved in accepting, knowing, but accepting God's truth for us, that we are to love one another. I'm thinking about, and yes, I know there's another passage of scripture that I'll get to eventually, but I'm thinking about my high school days, lo, a thousand years ago, back when I was in high school. When I played football, all four years, I was an offensive lineman, and it was just about this time of the year, in the second or third week of August, when our conference in those days finally allowed us to hold official football practices as a team. And did we ever, the month of August, when we were finally allowed to do it, we would get together and have three hour practices in the morning, take a break for lunch, if you could eat it, and three hours more in the afternoon. Two a day practices. It was in the middle of one of those practices in the August before my senior year in high school when we were running scrimmage plays first team offense against the first team defense. It was halfway through the practice in the afternoon and we were hot. It was just like today is going to be, like tomorrow is going to be, and even more humid. And our running back, a kid by the name of Rice, was in the huddle doing what he had been doing for the last three and now going into the fourth season, telling us in the huddle what a great running back he was, how he was really an all-star running back, probably all-state caliber, if only the rest of you guys would block for me. We've been hearing that for three years. And that afternoon, we just snapped, I guess. We broke the huddle and ran up to the line of scrimmage. And I heard every single offensive lineman, including myself, saying to the defense across the line, here's the play. We're going to sweep around the right end, and Rice is carrying the ball. And we're not blocking. Rub blocks. They look like they're blocking, but it's what it sounds like to rub the player as he runs by. Well, that's exactly what we did. Good old Rice got the ball and was crushed in the backfield about four year, yards behind the line of scrimmage. We all jogged back to the huddle. <clears throat> Johnny Milchanowski, our quarterback, said, let's get it right, same play. <laughs> Rice was a little dazed, but he was the all-star. <laughs> and we did exactly the same thing. It wasn't a very kind thing to do. It was a terrible thing for us to do. One player running against 11 players. But we had just reached the point where we had to do something. That's what we did. We didn't want Rice to get hurt, and he didn't get hurt. He had his, in the euphemism of football, his bell rung during those two plays. And for the rest of the three years we played together, we didn't hear his speech anymore in the huddle. Our head coach was standing behind the offensive huddle about eight or ten yards, something like that. And he surely understood exactly what he was seeing in front of him, but he said nothing. When we got back into the huddle after the second play, when none of us blocked, Johnny Milchanowski said, just so you know, we're a team. 
There are no individual all-stars all on this team. We're a team, and that's how we play together. If any of you thinks that you're a one-man show, then we'll all lose because we're a team. But we'll lose because of you. If that's what you think you're going to do, then you might as well go sit on the bench right now. Because we are all in this together, or we're not in it at all. That's what Johnny Milchanowski said. And as I said, Rice never again resumed his speech about being an all-star. And to his credit, he took it all that day, without <coughs> complaining about it to any of us. We ended up having a pretty good season, actually, as a team. Scapegoating, blaming, players dividing against players. It's a terrible strategy for a football team to do something like that. A terrible strategy for any team sport. We're in it together. That's how you win, and sometimes that's how you lose. But you're in it together. I guess. When I played football, we saw any number of other teams that never learned that. Teams, sometimes we'd encounter them and they had somebody that they clearly identified as being the all-star on their team and they relied on him to win the games, no matter how bad they were as a team. Usually they lost. Sometimes we played teams that had clearly identified one person who was the scapegoat who was the one on whom everything got blamed, all the failures, even though the team was bad as a team. I suppose it's human nature, actually, looking for a, a savior to rescue us from ourselves, or on the other hand, conversely, looking for a scapegoat on whom to blame our own failures. At my seminary graduation, the president of the seminary, a gentleman named James I. McCord, stood up and addressed our class by reading a poem, a poem entitled Waiting for the Barbarians, written in, of all things, 1898 by an Egyptian poet named C.P. Kavafi. Never heard of it. Not before, not since. It's a poem about that, scapegoating or waiting for the hero all-star. It's a conversation, really, between two people, and I'm not going to read you the whole thing, but I'll read you a little the beginning, and then I'll read you the ending, and you'll get the idea from that. What are we waiting for assembled here in the forum, asked the first person. The barbarians are new here today. Why isn't anything happening in the Senate? Why do the senators sit there without legislating? Well, because the barbarians are coming today. What laws can the senators make now? Once the barbarians are here, they'll do the legislating. Why did our emperor get up so early, and why is he sitting at the city's main gate on his Rome in state, wearing his crown. Because the barbarians are coming today, and the emperor is waiting to receive their leader. He's even prepared a scroll to give him, replete with titles and imposing names. Why don't our distinguished orators come forward as usual and make their speeches? Say what they have to say. Because the barbarians are coming today. And they're bored by rhetoric and public speaking. Wait. Why this sudden restlessness? This confusion? How serious people's faces have become. Why are the streets and squares emptying so rapidly? Everyone going home lost in thought. 
because night has fallen and the barbarians haven't come. And some who have just returned from the border say, there aren't any barbarians any longer. Now what's going to happen to us without the, without the barbarians? They were, those people, a kind of solution. Our human tendency, I think, is to await the savior barbarians or to await the scapegoat barbarians because they allow us, you and me, to avoid, to get off the hook of the responsibility and accountability for the way we are living our lives. And yet, the truth of the matter is, we're all in this life-living business together. God put us here. And thanks be to God, in Christ, we know how to do it. If we will. I tell you nothing that you do not already know when I say to you that we are living right now in a barbarian waiting culture in this country. We are awaiting the barbarian scapegoats. Lots of denigration, lots and lots of divisiveness, more childish name calling than any of us can stand. Bald faced lying. So many in number that we've lost count. And no one, no one seems to want to take the responsibility for trying to correct any of it. We know how to do it. We're in this business of life living together. God's people. We know how to do it. If we will. It begins, I think, with a reaffirmation of who we are in our hearts, in our minds, who we are. Think about this. In 1892, a Baptist pastor living in New England, of all places, a guy by the name of Francis Bellamy took it upon himself to write a pledge of allegiance to the flag of this country. A Baptist pastor living in New England. It was a, a, a pledge that he tweaked along the way, and it was finally officially approved by the Congress of the United States, but not until 1945. This is what Bellamy wrote in 1892 and the year or so thereafter. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Actually, in 1892, in his first draft, he didn't even name the country. He thought it was obvious. But then on second thought, some people reading it said, no, you need to put the name in, the United States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, under God wasn't added until 1954 by our Congress. Reverend Bellamy was long deceased by then. One nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Not just for the few with the loudest mouths while we seek to draw out the scapegoat barbarians to blame our shortcomings on. Liberty and justice for all. We know who we are as Americans. We know that. More to the point, though, we who inhabit this world 
not just this nation, but we who inhabit this whole wide world are children of God, created by the one God. We have been put here by God to be living our lives faithfully together. One people. We are one kin. Which leads me to the proclamation of kingdom values that you'll find in your bulletin this morning. It's on a sheet that looks like that. I hope you'll take a moment and read through it carefully this afternoon, not right now. It's a statement that was produced by our Presbyterian Church USA General Assembly when it met just over a month ago. It's a statement of whose we are and who we are to be as Presbyterian Christians. In part, it says this. We say yes to God's power of love and justice for the neighbor as well as the self. And we say no to demonic power that urges hate of the other, scatters blame, and creates civic discord. We say yes to bridges and preservation of families, and no to the walls. We say yes to affirming and celebrating the full spectra of human identity, and no to discrimination and bigotry. But far larger than just that proclamation of our Presbyterian kingdom values, there is the teaching of God's truth that appears in Mark's Gospel. Reading in chapter 12, verses 28 to 31, this is what Mark reported. One of the scribes came near and heard them, there were some other scribes and Pharisees with Jesus, heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he, Jesus, answered them well, this particular scribe asked him, which commandment is the first of all? And Jesus answered, this, the first, is here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. We know who we are as Americans, a people of liberty and justice, for all. We know who put us here in this world and what we are to, as we seek to live together as God's children. Love God with all our mind and soul and heart and strength and our neighbor as ourselves. Those aren't just so many words be uttered in the sanctity of a church sanctuary in a Sunday morning worship service, easily uttered, and just as easily forgotten when you walk back out that door into a barbarian waiting culture. That's not what they are. These are the words expressing God's truth, love of God, love of one another. They aren't just easy words. It is a, a series of words that include a responsibility placed on us. The responsibility is we are the ones who must bear our witness to God's truth in all faithfulness, in everything we say and everything we do, not just in here, but out there in that barbarian waking culture. Silence, doing nothing, 
is not an acceptable or faithful witness to our God. It just isn't. We are all in this together, or else we're all out of it. We are called by God as one people together to bear our witness. We know how to do it. We know how to do it. We know what's required of us. Love God. Love our neighbors. If we think it's important enough 